sometimes you can put a limit order way, way, way above the market and somebody is stupid enough to buy it and push it higher. Well, one day is Thursday, October 17th. <laughs> How that happened, 2024. And this is the week weekend chart. So obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for attending. Looks like the numbers are starting to build once again. So thank you for that. So we talk about, well, obviously current market conditions as usual. I have a lot to say about that. Your questions on trading, feel free to type them in now. If you're watching the simulcast on YouTube, just uh, give me a minute or two to catch up to you. And we should be able to handle it tonight, but uh, get to all these stock picks. So if you have any stock picks you want me to look at, you can go ahead and put them in, uh, punch them in now. Crypto too, we'll do crypto and then we'll do stocks. So we're gonna focus on, well, this week, and I think as long as there's a lot going on, I do want to focus mostly on the methodology in action. And we have mystery chart up, updates this week. We have a new mystery chart, a TFM 10% update, and some altcoin trade updates, or at least one of those, and the Landry 100. And that'll make sense in just one second. I also have one little thing I want to touch upon tonight, which could, as usual, lead to a bunch of more stuff. But a million little things will make you a successful trader. And again, that'll make sense in a second. I hate when people tell you what they're gonna tell you. Don't just tell you. <laughs> Here's the claim screen, as you know, you can lose, for, lose money trading, he tried to say. <laughs> Don't know what happened there. I like to sum it up by saying, borrowing a line from my buddy, Greg Morris, all predictions about the future and a lot of stuff can ask me now and then. There's all my contact information. Again, feel free to do a screenshot. You can also reach me at Dave at DaveLandry.com. All right, let's talk about the mystery charts and the methodology and action. So we have a new mystery chart this week. This is a relatively new issue, AKA an IPO. Notice that it began to take off nicely. It has a bigger picture cup and handle look to it. I usually don't like stocks with at high level cup and handles, but this is a, an IPO. And uh, the high-level ones I don't like a lot just because you have a bit of a double top happening, whereas if you, they're coming off of major lows, uh, in this, this case, it's all-time lows, and it's an IPO. So I, I like actually like the pattern. Uh, but anyway, nice nice uh, Landry light, as you can see, illustrated uh, below, and then a pullback to the moving average. Remember, this just measures the number of bars of Landry light, not the magnitude. So Right here, you can see quite a few bars were below that 30. What's the general rule we talk about almost every week? Never buy any stock that is trading below 30 EMA. You're welcome, or crypto for that matter. But anyway, Landry Light goes to zero the moment you intersect the moving average. In this case, I'm using the 30-day exponential moving average. Anyway, nice little pullback to the moving average. Entry is here, stop is down here. An additional profit target is up here, and I'll follow up with this one, obviously and upcoming webinars. By the way, everything that I like to show you trade-wise, it's something that I've done, uh, I've showed you before I actually did it. In the case of the mystery charts, those come straight from my trading service. You can look at the archives at davelander.com slash archives. The crypto trades, sometimes I do them live in the webinar, which I did a few weeks back. If I see something I really like, I'll uh, fire up a trade. And I, I've been in more recent times, I've been posting them to the Facebook group just so that uh, there's no hindsight involved with any of this that I show. I mean, anybody could have a uh, hundred losing trades and one winner and show you the winner. Like, see, look how easy it is. Anyway, this is CLOV. This is a former mystery chart. I'll go through it pretty quickly since we talked about it quite a bit. It was first recommended on August 28th, and those were the parameters there. And you can see you have nice slander light, little kiss of the moving average, but that's okay because it, it held the moving average. And then it began to accelerate higher. And that's a pattern I call accelerating momentum strategy. And I have a, a lot of different variations of a pullback, but when you boil it all down, they're just pullbacks, right? And then I pull back to the moving average. You can see the Landry light goes from 20 something in here down to zero, again, because you intersect the moving average. And entry was here, stop was here, initial profit target was here. Now, one thing I was shown with this position, showing the ups and downs, and one thing I'm I'm getting into a lot lately is showing you what trend following is all about and how it's a lot harder than it looks 
on the surface, but it can be done, especially if you're willing to do nothing and not watch every tick and get too excited about the ups or downs. But anyway, we got in a position within a few days, we were up $400. And then about a week or so later, we were down $360. And I know a lot of people gave up on it and bailed then. And truth be told, maybe I would too, would have too, had I just been trading this on my own, maybe years ago, before I actually had a trading service where at the trading service, I tell you what I'm going to do, and then I'm forced to actually do it, which is a great, what they call a commitment device. And maybe next week, if I haven't, I don't know if I've already mentioned or not, but for a million little things, we could talk about commitment devices. And I have a few stories there that I beat the dead horse on. Imagine that, me beating a dead horse. <laughs> anyway, a few days later, two days later, we're up $2,000. At that point, that's the IPT, the initial profit target. We bank half of our profits, so we sell half of our shares, no questions asked. And we do that intraday, meaning that if it spikes to that level, you want to get out. You don't want to sit around and wait to see if it's going to close there. There is a little discretion we occasionally use. Sometimes you can squeeze out a little more profits. In this case, if you go back and look at the actual trades that are reported from my model account in this one, go back a few weeks in the week of charts, you'll notice that I didn't quite get that $1,000 in the first low. And that's because it kept getting close to four and backing off, close to four, backing off. And then I got the things like, you know, the real money is in the second low. And that's that's the way I kind of look at things. And then it did end up closing above the IPT and hitting it and closing above it, or at it at least. So that wor it would have worked out without discretion. So I made a few less dollars, I think $50 less, on that half of the trade. I did take it across multiple accounts, so I did okay on this. Don't worry about me, <laughs> or this one at least. You have to worry about some of that bad behavior that I'm always talking about, because I can't occasionally be guilty. When the initial profit target is hit, you bump that stop up to break even, and now you're free rolling and barring overnight gaps. You have the chance of a free position and a potential home run. Now, I may have jinxed this, because earlier today, this thing was up like 30 cents, and on a four dollar stock that's a huge move so we were up 17 10 and remember we already banked a thousand this is on a hypothetical 100k account although i do actually have what is it a thousand shares left on on whatever that little thing said earlier you buy two thousand shares in this particular case because it was a one point stop now even ludicrous would say that's kind of a wide and ludicrous stop but that's what it called for if you squint your eyes two dollars is right here and the stock is right there, it's not that far away. And as I've said quite a bit, people get really tripped up on high percentage stops, but if a stock is bouncing around 10 to 15% a day, then you're gonna have to have your stop well out of that normal volatility and range, something I preach quite often. In fact, as I also preach, if you're having trouble becoming a successful and consistent trader, trade at a much, much, much smaller size and loosen your stops a lot, okay? And then that way, eventually you'll catch some nice trends. And I'm gonna show the importance of that. I kind of backed into something that I'm gonna show you in a few minutes, uh, the importance of catching that occasional home run and how trend following does eventually work, provided you don't give up in the meantime. But anyway, we're in longer term trend following mode on the second loaf. Remember the first loaf, okay, with 2,000 shares, buy them all at once. In other cases, if it's a much wider stop or higher price issue, whatever the case may be. Anyway, it's, it all, it's all based on the stop. So I guess at a higher price issue, the stop could be farther away on a point basis, which would make the stop smaller. So let me just kind of close that loop on that by saying that. So if it's a higher price stock, and it's a it's a fairly volatile stock like I like to trade, then that stop will probably be like, let's say like 10 points away. When a 10 point stop, you would only trade, I think 200 shares if my math in my head is right, on a trade like that. Whereas this case, we're only using one point stop. So that's 2000 shares. And by the way, as I've said quite often, when you can get into these, issues at a relatively low price. Now this stock was a stock that was much higher than this and it came down and bottomed out nicely. 
and kind of like the coal company that we rode forever. And I think Jeff's still in it. He's here tonight. We rode it up, and at one point we were up 500%. And and the the point gains on that and the dollar gains were huge because we got it in around five bucks a share, and it ran up like to 20, 30 bucks, whatever it was. So if you can catch a big winner, and I'm not saying you want to bottom fish, obviously you want to trade momentum like we're doing here, but this stock was at a relatively low level. And sometimes those can make some wonderful trades that last a long, long time. But so, but anyway, we're in longer term, again, in longer term trend following mode. And we begin to let that stop gradually loosen up to, to more of a, a longer term trend following type of methodology. Uh, longer term trend following, drawdowns are abysmal, and I'll show you an example of that in just one second. And your accuracy is going to be very low, but as you'll see in a second too, I said I wasn't going to tell you what I was going to tell you. I'm just going to tell you. <laughs> uh, but the again, the drawdowns are abys abysmal and accuracy is low, but one good trade can pay for it all. Spoiler alert. All right, here's a live crypto trade update. I'd forgotten I made this trade a few weeks ago and the weekend charts and there's the actual trade now keep in mind with these shit coins s-h-y-t i'm just trading at a small size and i'm having a lot of fun with this and the moment my size gets a lot lot bigger it'll probably be a lot harder to trade but i don't think you need to put a lot of money in crypto but i i think that it's worth trading on a very small basis my bread and butter will probably always be stocks, but if I could pick up a little here and there and apply some of this technical analysis thing to crypto, then why not? I'm also playing a little game where I'm mining off a little bit and from the shit coins and putting it to Bitcoin. So from crap becomes something that's, I hate to say tangible, but a slightly, slightly more real. Anyway, the entry was here, and this is just a, a, just a generic type of pullback type of pattern. And let me see if we back the chart out a little bit. You can see it was in a very persistent trend here. You can see it, it was accelerating and then it pulled back. So just kind of a generic type of pullback, nothing too fancy there. And I only put a thousand dollars into it, you know, just S and G type of stuff and entered there in the week of charts. You can go back and watch it. So what day was that? That was, do we have a date in here? Yeah, on the third. So that was two weeks ago. And it looks like it was uh, toward the end of the weekend chart, 6.48 my time. And that's when we uh, take a look at crypto and we take a look at um, stocks. But anyway, so far so good. I'll trail a stop on the remainder and we'll see what happens. And as I said a second ago, I mined off 25 bucks. I put in a little bit extra to allow for commissions too. And as I've said a thousand times, of course the nerd in me, I looked into mining way too late just to think, you know, I could plug a couple of uh, servers into the garage or in the back of my office and let them just make some free money for me while I sleep and while I work all day too. And then I realized that it's probably not worthwhile doing. And I tried other experiments where I kept a little money in the native coin, just a small amount, and that failed miserably. So what I started doing is when I hit the IPT in these, I peel off a little bit, like a tiny bit, and put it in Bitcoin. I was using much bigger numbers for a while, and it was making it was making the math hard to work on the on the trading. The other thing I'll do is if something hits a double, I'll mine off a little bit of a double. And sometimes if they make a big spike higher, like this one earlier spiked higher, and I missed it because I wasn't paying attention. But sometimes you can put a limit order at way 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 above the market, and somebody is stupid enough to buy it and push it higher. That's that's what the greater fool is. We are greater fool hunters. We want somebody more stupid than we are to come along and buy the trade. We're searching for the greater fool. And we can call them the greater fool because sometimes we are the greater fool. Anybody ever buy the high tick of the market? <laughs> of course you have, right? I may have done that earlier today. Anyway, uh, quick update on the TFM 10% system. Again, here are the zones which were inspired by Jeff, who's here tonight. Initially, I just had a 10% line in here, 10% from the 50-week closing high. 
And I don't know why I use 50 week other than I was using a 50 week moving average. Maybe I just wanted everything to be the same number. That's the rules to sell. The designer's intent, as I'll flesh out in just one second, was to get out of the way and hopefully avoid what Ian McActiffy used to call the diaper change moments. I borrowed that term from him. But anyway, you just need to close 50, 10% or more away from the 50 week closing high and close below the 50 simple moving average. I have plenty of YouTubes on that on my YouTube channel. By the way, I'm, I never remember to say like and subscribe. If you're liking this video, then like it. And if you don't like it, go have no fun somewhere else. Boy, I tell you, <laughs> YouTube took away the don't like. And then you'll watch a video and be like, what? This sucks. <laughs> you know, it used to be like you'd see like two likes and 3,000 dislikes. And you're like, okay, I know that that's probably some bad information. You know. <laughs> anyway, that's the sell. Pretty simple rules. And you can see right there, close below 10%, the buy line, the 10% line, and uh, below the 50 week moving average. The buys are a little bit more stringent. You have to close within 10% of the 50 week closing high and have two bars of Landry light. It means lows greater than the moving average, bar one, bar two. So this was the last buy there. And not going wood so far, so good. It's been a pretty good run. The sell would be a close below that 10% line, or the 10% away from the 50 week closing high and below the moving average again. So I don't want to get into it, but it did anyway. Uh, one thing I've been watching lately is the, the zones are now moving nicely higher so you have to make a new 52 week closing high for the zones to move higher so that's just kind of a neat thing and maybe there's some sort of um experimenting you could do with that as far as a system in and of itself but you could see it flattens out every now and then then begins to take off by the way the five percent reason i had that in was because jeff pointed out he likes to get out of a market when he's down five percent and that's keep in mind that because you know, somebody was uh, there's somebody that's a fan of this on Twitter, and I was showing the the 230 EMA system triggered recently on Bitcoin, but it had a lot of overhead supply, and he's like, why not use just use the TFM 10% system? Well, I've experimented with it, but in a super volatile market like Bitcoin, you know, maybe once it matures, which it's slowly maturing, obviously. It becomes more and more efficient, like the S&P 500 or the Qs or even the Russell, which you'll see in one second. Then something like this might work, but I think your stop would have to be so darn wide that it's probably it would be probably hard to make it work. So this system was originally designed. Designers' intent is very important, by the way. But designers' intent on this was a system to use in the S&P 500 to keep you out of trouble when things turn south. Anyway, for s and as I've said, ad nauseum, I bought 100 shares of the Qs, and so the sale would be way down there around 440. It would have to close 10% away or more from the 50-week closing high and the 50-week moving average. Now, as I say weekly, if your moving average is above your, your sell line, it has to still close below the sell line. The 50-week moving average is just a whipsaw filter because sometimes you may get a spike down in a market and come right back up. And the reason I use a 50 week simple moving average is, believe it or not, I wanted to incorporate some lag into the system. So you're not in and out like the like the rat going for the cocaine. I don't like cocaine, but I like the way it smells. Uh, I think that's a little old, but it's somewhere around sixteen, seventeen thousand dollars $17,000. I forgot to update that part of the slide. Now, here's the deal. As I've said quite a bit, if you're following a pure trend-following system, the drawdowns are going to be abysmal. And I didn't intend this to be a pure trend-following system. I just wanted something, again, to help me avoid some of those diaper change moments like the pandemic, the market completely ignored the pandemic. And then all of a sudden the market's like, oh shit, we better get out, you know? And so all of a sudden everybody's running for the exit at the same time and the system triggered a sell. By the way, I'm just noticing this, but notice that we almost went below this 10% level here. 
And again, it would also have to close below that moving average, which in this case was a ways away from it. But notice that the moving average has caught up to the, the sell line, or the, I call it the sell line, the buy line, the 10% line, okay? And you know what's interesting, I was just thinking about this right before I went live. At that point in time, you gave up nearly 80% of the gains that you had from this trend signal back here. And if you were to stop out way down here, you could possibly almost end or, or come very close to giving up 100% and maybe even a, a losing trade. So pure trend following, again, your drawdowns are going to be abysmal and you are going to risk a lot of money. And this was the, this was a little bit more painful one. And as I say each week, when I put this on, it was just S and G's, 100 shares, who cares, right? But then all of a sudden it's like, holy crap, I just lost $4,500. And then holy crap, I just lost $8,000. It's like, wait a minute. But I'm just going to follow it and see what happens. And I don't recommend following mechanical systems. But if you're newer to trading, that might be one way to get your reps in, find something that's somewhat mechanical. And maybe even better is find something like persistent pullbacks, especially with like combined with something like Landry Light pullbacks, where you're pulling back to the moving average. So it's fairly quantifiable. And then you can look for other things in there, uh, make it a little subjective analysis too. But get get a little closer to that mechanical trading and then slowly add on layers of discretion from there. And trade small, loosen your stops. You gotta get the reps in. And I'll beat the dead horse on that quite a bit. I'll show you why I'm showing the Russell in, in just one second. So I, I thought I would take a look at this and, and the long story endless, which we'll get to the long story in one second. There was a gentleman who was was wanted to sell his Russell shares. And I'm like, well, why don't you wait for a TFM 10% sell signal? Now the Russell's a little wide and loose. And I started dueling with it a little while ago, earlier today, I should say. And I didn't I didn't mechanically test it, but just eyeballing it, I think it's it's it would probably work longer term, as I'll show you a few things here in just one second. But I would prefer something that trades a little bit more cleanly, like the Qs or the P's. But anyway, you can see there was a buy here, a sell here. And I added that up. That's a 20 point, 20.33 point cent loss. And then there was a buy there and then a sell there. So you had two back to back losing trades. And then you had a buy here. And if you mark that to market, as I did earlier at 225, that's a 31. You're, you have 3128 of open profits. Now we don't know where it's going to end up. But it would be kind of fun to watch. So we add all that up, and you're actually now positive with this system. Not by a lot, but if this thing goes up another 10, 20, 30 points, then it might begin to add up. Now, I'm not recommending you, you trade this system here, but the reason I wanted to bring it up is you should have some sort of system to trade. You can't just trade based on your feelings or your mood. I saw somebody had a post in one of the trade up forums. Trade the market, not your mood, or well, the market's mood, not your own. I'll have to flesh that out. But anyway, it reminded me of Ed Dakota's Whipsaw song, and I actually attended a concert with left with uh, Ed Dakota, and it wasn't actually a concert. He just brought his banjo, and he gave a little speech at uh, one of our AAPTA meetings. And the whipsaw song, it's he talks about you get a whip and I get a saw, you get a whip and I get a saw. And you basically, you get whipsaw, whipsaw, whipsaw. And it's like, don't worry about that because one big trend pays for them all. Easier said than done. I get it. I know that. So very important takeaway there. And this is a screenshot this. Or you know what? Better yeah, just do a YouTube on it and listen to the song. And it's pretty good. You know, what do you do with a hot news flash, honey? We stash that we stash that flash right in the trash. Yeah. <laughs> what do you do when drawdown comes, honey? What do you do when it get if it gets real big, baby? What do you do when it when it's even bigger? We stick to the plan and pull the trigger. The pandemic is is my recent reference point whenever I'm looking at anything and how it performs. And it makes for a great reference point. As you can see, we had a sell in the Russell way back in October. 
2019 or 2018, okay? And there was a sizable sell-off there. It wasn't a huge sell-off, but it sure would have been nice to be out of the market for that sell-off. And then there was a buy here and a sell there. So that was another whipsaw, but the designer's intent for this was to avoid the diaper change moment. So look what happened next. The Russell imploded 35% over a very short period of time. And the S&P had a very similar type of move. Arthur, I got your setup, so we'll, we'll uh, take a look at those in one second. So the, again, the designer's intent was to be able to sleep at night when, when the whole world starts to come unglued. And so far, knock on wood, this system since it's been live and then going back a hundred years in historical testing has gotten you out of every bear market before it started, I kept you out of every bear market going all the way back to the early 1900s. But you can see you avoid that haircut there and then you catch a nice move higher here, okay? So that's a 33% move higher. So you avoided a 35% haircut. I feel like the, the lawyer and my cousin Vitty. Uh, but anyway, you avoided a 35% haircut and you gained 33%. Now, if you do the math, and I can't really do it in my head, but I'm guessing that a 35% loss takes probably 50 or 60% to make up, make that up. So by avoiding those big losses, now it did come back in this particular case. So you can be, well, David came back. Well, I can promise you it doesn't always come back. And I do remember in, what was it, 2008, the S&P 500 was making like 13 year lows, okay? So let's say you had a toddler and you just got around to start saving for his college when he was a few years old. And then all of a sudden it's time for junior to go to college Well, the market's lower than it was when you put the money in. Well, all the financial guys tell you, just put your money in the market. You're in for the long term, that's college savings. And a lot of the times they're right and they could be right for 20, 30 years. And that's why a lot of these guys have pretty good careers but eventually buy and hold will catch up to you. That's one of the things I can guarantee. But Dave, aren't you buying and hold the Bitcoin? Well, that's just small nickel and dime stuff. If, if that turns into six figures, then then yeah, I'll throw some money management in there, but I'm not really, that's just S and G's for now. All right, just real quick, I just wanna show you one slide real quick. This is Landry 100. This is something that, again, I did years ago and it was really kind of an amazing thing, but the software I was using was no longer made and it became kind of a pain in the butt to keep up with, with everything else. Plus the market got really choppy and I really couldn't find the stocks to fill it. But right now this thing is on fire and it's been pretty awesome. And I know you want to part of me, but it's been a lot of fun to do this. In fact, I look forward to the end of the day to where I could uh, work all the, find new stocks and, and get rid of old ones. And what's cool is like you 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 really see where all the money is flowing in the markets. It's a wonderful exercise. And I would encourage you to, to do something like this on your own too. And last week we were talking about, do you really need 100 stocks? I, I don't know. I don't have the answer to that. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't throw too much statistics at it. When it comes to markets, statistics are worthless. I think 74.3% of all people know that. Anyway, so the point being made here is all were bought at brand new highs. Now, again, you don't just want to rush out and buy a market and make a new highs. But if you buy enough of a market and make a new highs, in this case, it's 100 stocks, then your chances of catching some big winners can work out really, really, really nicely. So you've got 119% here. And that was put on into August. This one here we're looking at 70%. And it was uh, middle of August here, middle of July. I'm sorry, end of July, middle of August. So, so you can see all these were put on in August. There's one from June. I only go back to the end of May, if memory serves. End of May, early June is when this, when I started this up again. But anyway, it's a, it's a cool thing to do. And here's my magic formula. To run this list there it is that's the whole formula in order to make this list this formula has to equal one okay so it means it's at a new closing high now i do sort this list by historical volatility which is a formula i can give you and i i pick the ones that are a little bit higher in volatility start with the high volatility ones and then i work my way down 
and usually I like to find stocks that are that are well above 30 or so. But keep in mind, there's gonna that's gonna ebb and flow as the market changes. At two dollars, it's like buying an indefinite call option. Yeah, so I, I hear you, Brian, and and you got to be careful with that kind of thinking. But I hear you, okay. So what Brian is saying is, let's say a stock's at at low levels, and I wouldn't, I'd encourage you not to bottom fish, okay. But if a stock is at low levels and you've got a nice technical analysis type of setup, a nice little setup, you could you could buy it and sit on it, and you could like Brian saying a two dollar stock. Well, I'm just going to use a two dollar stop. Yeah, it'd be like buying an option that never expires. And I know there's 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 danger in that, but I I hear you. But just make sure you have some sort of setup. I'm getting pop ups over here. I didn't want. I don't know what's happening. Okay, uh, Arthur, we'll get to you setups in just a minute as we get to the charts. Now, uh, key, one thing I did think about as I'm going live, this 252 number, if conditions begin to worsen, I might drop that down as low as like 90, 90 days. The only thing I'm, I'm, I'm not getting, and I realize that with this, this Landry 100 ran off of new closing highs for 52 weeks, as I'm not really picking up the stocks at lower levels, but I had start, I had, recently started adding in a few ipos and that's been a lot of fun too because some of these guys take off now one thing i did want to show you a second ago and we talked about this last week with this hrow it had a similar pattern but i think we got in like right here and you can see this thing just drifted down for a week or two in some cases you, you buy that it's like you buy here and it immediately goes through a sharp correction now other times the next day it's up another 20 or 30 percent or something crazy but yeah, a lot of times you you buy, so to speak, in this list. And and I'm not actually trading this, although every morning I think wake up thinking about how can I make this work longer term? And uh, maybe when I'm retired or something, this might be the portfolio. I'll just run the Landry 100. Okay, let's take a look at, all right, so there's your form there. Now, the random thoughts. And this is what makes me feel good. I'm a, I'm a man on the street kind of guy. I like to listen to what, People are talking about what people are saying, and I usually I'm kind of I'm not gonna say to myself because now I walk in the gym and was like Dave, and I'm like hey, but usually I I don't you know say a lot, just kind of get my workout in so I can get in, get out, and um, because I have a, a technical analysis tattoo, people notice it, and then that sparks up conversations. But anyway, again, I'm kind of a man of street kind of guy, and it, it it's good to talk to people and realize that technical analysis is alive and well. So let me show you where I'm going with this. So I have a friend from the gym, let's let's call him, let's call him Don. Um, and let's just, Don Erickson, okay? And um, he doesn't really look like this. He's, he's a little older and um, he's more gray and he's a few pounds heavier, but um, Don Erickson, just let's just call him that. He's um he's from Covington. He lives on uh 115 Smith Lane. You you go to downtown Covington, right off Columbia Street, his little subdivision over there. But anyway, this is hypothetical Don, right? But anyway, he told me that he was in the Russell 2000, and a few months back he said he's gonna get out of break even. And every day I go to gym when when it begins to rally, he starts talking about it. He would sell it off. He's like, oh, it's selling off. And I told him. And he's familiar with the TFM 10% system because he watched a little bit of my stuff. And I told him, look, don't, don't look to get out at break even. You don't want to sell as it's going up. Sell when it's going down, okay, to get your capital out of harm's way. But as long as it's going up, stick with it. And he told me a couple of weeks back, he goes, I was finally at break even a couple of weeks ago. And you could tell, I could tell by the way he was telling me that he was kind of like, damn, I should have sold while I had the chance. Now, the reason I'm saying technical analysis is alive and well is that's how a double top works in markets, okay? People looking to sell at break even. Livermore talks a lot about how people sell stocks. People in general, and I tripped up on this a few weeks ago, but people in general don't sell stocks when they're dropping they sell them on the way up. And that, that kind of dovetails in with the hope and the fear type of things. The, 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 the novice, the non-trader type, 
tends to flip hope and fear. They fear that their position is going, their profits are going to evaporate, and then they hope their loss doesn't get any bigger. And that that creates kind of a, a inversion or the opposite, so to speak, of what you should do. You should be a good little trend following moron and follow that trend higher, as opposed to looking to get out of break even. Trading for break even is not a good strategy. Anyway, so I'm guessing that was right around that time. Like I said, a few weeks ago, he told me that he was finally back to break even. And then he, he was saying this with regret. It was break even a few years, a few weeks before he was telling me. But anyway, so he told me on the 14th, a couple of days ago, and I think it was actually on the 15th, it was Tuesday. He goes, I, I got out of Russell at break even. And he was kind of proud of himself. And I'm like, why did you do that? <laughs> now, the old me used to sort of coddle people and say, oh, okay, well, whatever. And the new me, because I get I get sick of people hounding me for what to do, so I just tell them. It's like, don't sell on the way up, okay? Sell on the way down, but don't sell on the way up. So him selling this has nothing to do with the actual market. If you think about it, it has nothing to do with the PE, whatever that is, of the of the Russell 2000 stocks. It has nothing to do with the situation in Nigeria. I was going to say the situation in Israel, but the situation in Nigeria is even more important, right? So this just tells me technical analysis is alive and well. Why did he sell? He sold because he got out of break even, because he bought in at a high level, and he kind of felt like, Boy, I'll never do that again. Well, the problem with that is if that's your strategy, is one, you'll never make any money. And two, you might even have this thing drop and drop and drop and drop and drop. And 10 years from now, when it's 50% lower, and, and you're probably like, oh, Dave, an index will never do that. Yes, it will. The SP, as I just said, made 13 year lows. I think it was in 2000. At eight, and, and believe it or not, and, and people will argue with me over this, and I just no longer bring it up. <laughs> if I'm at a cocktail party, I'd rather just have a drink and be left alone as far as the markets are concerned. But I'll tell them things like the market could go 25 years or more without making a new high, and people do not believe me. Now, I did see someone a while back said the market has never gone 30 years without making a new high. I was like, okay, well, you got me there. And by the way, as Greg Morris points out, buy and hold metrics are based on an 81-year time horizon. And as Sweet Brown says, ain't nobody got time for that. <laughs> anyway, so that was not Don Erickson. I just made up his name. But uh, so Don sold out. So I'm going to beat up Don whenever I see him. <laughs> Brian says, that break even, you can make it up in volume. Yeah. <laughs> Sell everything for a loss and make it up in volume. Lately, been doing a series, a million little things. We're getting ready to jump in the markets. We have plenty of time tonight. So I just have one little thing I wanted to cover today. I, I found some old notes. And then I actually found a complete presentation on cognitive bias that I'd like to get into. Maybe over the next couple of weeks, I'll, I'll redo that. I, I was looking through my old presentations. And one of them said, cognitive bias, pretty good. It's like, well, that sounds like a pretty good presentation. That's where I grabbed one of these slides from. But anyway, the the premise of this series or whatever you want to call it is that everyone thinks president company included that a switch is going to flip or like you snap and all of a sudden you're a trader yeah, okay but the reality is it doesn't work that way it's a million little things that will make you a successful trader and it's a million little things that will keep you a successful trader very hard not to become the definition of the sanity, insanity doing the same thing over and over expecting a different outcome. And as I often say, and Livermore said it long before me, is that a trader sometimes makes mistakes and knows he is making them. I've done complete presentations just on that. Anyway, without further ado, this week, many little things. Number 608,153, subordinate thy will. Roy Longstreet wrote a little book it's called Viewpoints of a Commodity Trader. 
And I gave away my copy. I didn't realize it was a rare copy. And I didn't give it away because because I I didn't like it. I was just going to buy me another copy. And then I went to try to find a new copy. And that's before it was in paperback. And what do you guys think? It was Mike Peterson uh, sent me a paperback copy of it because I bitched about it so much in the webinars because I was stupid to give it away. But it's a great little book. And again, you can get it in paperback. It's a lot cheaper in paperback. If you can find the original version, that's uh, that'd be awesome, right? But uh, it's the viewpoints of a commodity trader. And he said the deepest secret for the trader is his ability to subordinate his own will to the will of the market. Now, there's different ways of looking at that. And, and that's where it dovetails in with the cognitive biases, okay? It's like Don, for instance, is coming at the market from the angle of he just wants to get to break even as opposed to coming at it from, hey, this thing's making new highs. I'm finally making some money. I'm going to hang on to it because that's what the market's will seems to be. Or on the flip side, you think a market should be going higher and then it keeps going down and you've got to stop in place or, or you pull that stop thinking that, well, maybe it'll stop going down. I don't want it to go any further. Well, who wants to lose money? Nobody. But unfortunately, shit happens, sometimes twice. So learn how to subordinate your will to the market. Uh, read Roy Longstreet, again, Viewpoints of a Commodity Trade. If you go to my website and go to davelander.com slash books dash two dash read, I have all of these books listed there. All right, let's shift gear get in, and get into crypto. Here's that arrow. You know what these guys do? I have no idea. <laughs> I don't care, okay? Uh, here's Bitcoin. Now, Bitcoin has been improving. You see you have bar one, bar two. That's a 230 EMA system. I wouldn't recommend you trade that system mechanically, especially when you have like a ton of ton of overhead resistance, even though this trade would have worked. One thing that does kind of amaze me about that silly little system is you just, again, two bars of Landry light, okay? And you buy above the high with rig with a little wiggle room. So right there, let me draw this out for you. You would probably think it's a trade, but right here, oops, let me do that. But right here, you see bar one, bar two. You would buy above this high again plus a little wiggle room. What amazes me is often a market will oscillate around that 30 EMA, and you'll never get a, a trade. So, and then again, the 30 EMA as a say a nauseam can often keep you out of a lot of trouble. But Bitcoin still has its work cut out for it. It still has some overhead supply to get through. You know, like Michael Saylor says though, what's, what's pretty damn impressive about Bitcoin, one of the many things he says, and I try not to listen to him too much because when I, when I do, I get all bullish. You want to just buy a bunch of Bitcoin and hodl it. But one thing that he was talking about is the, and he had a better word for it, but uh, for lack of a better word, the fan base on Bitcoin is huge. And you watch those people every day talk about, oh God, you just made my stomach sink. So that the, John just said that the viewpoints is $4,995 on Amazon. Wow. Well, I hope whoever gave it to <laughs> is enjoying it. <laughs> If I see it on eBay from them, I'm going to be pissed. <laughs> I forgot who I gave it to. Charlie Kirk asked um, at his retreat. He had a retreat a few years back in St. Louis, and he asked us all, uh, St. Louis, St. Lucia. Uh, St. Louis was uh, not, a, it's a nice place, but not quite as good a retreat as St. Lucia. Anyway, uh, he asked us all to bring a book. And, and so it's like, oh, look, I'm not going to bring like a big, huge book, you know, encyclopedia. But I did like, to, uh, yes, like, well, there's some little books in my library that I absolutely love. Uh, what's the one? The one by Selden is really good. In fact, the presentation that I that I picked that that Longstreet quote out of has a bunch of quotes by Selden. I bought that one. Um, I would buy that one if I were you. Uh, and I would. Uh, and again, that's all in the. Let's see if I have it handy. I usually keep it pretty handy, but that's all in the book stash two dash three. I think it's the psychology of trading or psychology of the market. This was written like a hundred years ago. Uh, years ago, I haven't done it lately, but years ago especially my wife would go to bed early on a weekend and I had a few beers in me. I would get on eBay and look for vintage books on trading. Uh, spec the word speculation, they called them a, a lot of the books back then were called speculation. 
And I, I've got a few turds out of the process and a few things that have nothing to do with stocks, but I've picked up quite a few of those uh, those old books in the process. I actually bought that uh, book hardcover back in the day, and that version is worth a lot of money. Anyway, I've, I've totally digressed here. Uh, here's some other ones I'm long. I don't know if I've mentioned these before, so so I hate to 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 brag on them or anything, but this one, again, kind of like a pullback-ish pattern, and it took off, knock on wood, uh, today, earlier, right before the presentation. And then this Yuma, I bought this one a little while ago, so uh, should I talk about it again? It's at two two ninety five now. It's only about 10 cents away from where I bought it earlier today. And that's it. Uh, as I've said quite often, sometimes with these shit coins, when they're really moving, you can just sort them by relative strength and by the strongest ones. And notice the two that I'm long, or two of the ones that I'm long, are doing really well. And ideally, you want them, you want them, of course, to be above the 30 EMA, and ideally breaking out to decent highs. Now. As I often say, I'm not a breakout trader, but when these things are really, really moving, they could really, they could really work out nicely. Fridgey said he spent his honeymoon in St. Lucia. Did you come back without a tan? <laughs> I guess that's TMI, huh? All right, let's shift gears to stocks. And uh, Brian's been wait, waiting patiently. Let's take a look at this. Uh, he had a comment on this, and we'll get to the individual issues. Oh, anybody want to look at any shit coins? Okay, let's go here. So Brian said that the ASML debacle, okay, it said where they say they accidentally released earnings and forecast numbers, not buying it. What's your take on the semiconductor space from here? Okay. Uh, We'll get to the semis in just one second. Ah, uh, I don't, I don't read into those kind of things. But yeah, I think you have to be skeptical at everything. And yeah, it's pretty nasty little spill. But here's the thing, okay? This stock before this debacle, and years ago I learned something really important. And if you Go all the way, you know, if you go all the way back to Livermore, somewhere buried in one of his books, it's, it's there too, either in Reminiscence or How to Trade Stocks. But surprises generally happen in the direction of the trend. Write that down, okay? Now, you could argue that, well, this surprise up here was at high levels, but this thing started to trend lower, okay? And there's no pattern of mine that would buy this stock as it's pretty much in a free fall, okay? And then look what happens. You have a, a big surprise in the direction of the trend. Look at the angle. That's like a 50 simple moving average, I think, there. Look at the angle of the 50 simple moving average. It's going straight down, okay? They have one little pop-up above it. Somebody knew to get off the hook here, probably. So, Brian, I don't know how to... What's the word? How to process that? Excuse me. Into the into the semiconductor space in general. Um, but if you're keeping tabs, that obviously scores as a negative. Now, from a technical analysis standpoint, I would score this as a negative by saying, well, this thing was headed higher, and now it's headed lower. This was a former leader. Okay, so maybe the sector is beginning to crack. And when NVIDIA cracked a while back, I became nervous about, concerned about the semis. And that was followed by the fact that the semiconductors were overall sort of head lower. All right, let's take a look at the market real quick. We'll get to your stock picks right afterwards. I'll just take a few minutes here. S&P 500 today, we had an opening gap reversal. We did have a little breakout to all-time highs, so I wouldn't get too excited about today's action. You know me, though. I like to see a market hit new highs and keep hitting new highs for a while and then have an orderly pullback. But so far, so good on the P's. The NASDAQ composite opening gap reversal there. One thing I, I didn't like about the NASDAQ was that it had this bigger picture retrace look to it, not a tradable pattern. 
but it's just kind of working its way back up, kind of like an ABC to the old highs. And I didn't like that pattern. I don't like that pattern, I should say. But we broke out a few days ago, and unfortunately came back in. And today's is kind of meandering around. So let's see what happens there. But for me to get excited about NASDAQ, it would have to bang out some new highs. Let's take a look. Uh, oh, uh, the Rusty, of course. We just looked at Rusty. Rusty's just shy of these multi-year highs. It's still got its work cut out for it, though. But if we could ever break out, I know it's a big if, but if we could ever break out the brand new highs, simply because everybody is dumping on the Rusty, Don, Erickson included, okay, that if we could clear through that supply, this thing could be off to the races. EFA shares, something I don't, it's some, EFA shares is something that only kind of matters when it matters. These are the foreign shares or non-US shares. And you can see that it's kind of looking ugly in here. It's all over the place, but now it's sold off fairly hard. Could bow tie to the downside. We're still the dog with least fleas. That's kind of the way I look at that. A lot of these stocks like cybersecurity have recently broken out and so far just pulling back a little bit. We just talked about Bitcoin. Gold, the commodity actually made all time highs. What's interesting is gold stocks tend to be choppy because they're based on the underlying commodity. The underlying commodity, commodities tend to be choppy as a general statement. They can trade nicely, don't get me wrong, but they often chop around, which makes them difficult to trade, difficult to trend follow. But every now and then, if you hit it just right, like the turtles did, they hit it just right, they absolutely printed money. And then they subsequently blew up. That's another story. Not to take anything away from them, though. I think a few of them were successful afterwards, but not many, unfortunately. Believe me, I would never be shot in Friday in this business. Broker deal has been on a tear. Look at that. A little bit of an opening gap reversal today. Not enough to get too excited about, but so far, so good there. Financials in general were a little questionable, but take a look at what they've done recently. Chopped around, chopped around, chopped around, couldn't break out the new highs, and then bam, off to the races. So that's looking pretty good. Okay, Keith, we'll get to that in just one second. Just a few more to go through here. Biotechnology, the point I'm making here and been making lately about the markets is it's improving, but it's still kind of mixed. So take a look at the IBB, bit of a triple top still in the works there, kind of retracing back towards those tops. So I would avoid this for now. If you didn't know anything about technical analysis, just look at the sideways nature. You want to buy markets that are going up, sell markets that are going down, and sit on your hands when they're going sideways. Software has been doing really well as of late, and so far it's just kind of pulling back, so that's looking pretty good. So we could see setups there. Health services back to the downside. It imploded all the way down to the 200-day moving average, okay? Nice little bounce off of that. I wouldn't buy a market for that in and of itself, but you can see it's bow tied to the downside and just not looking so hot in here. Lots of support below, though, so probably wouldn't make a good short at this juncture the fence is what all the wars and shit going on <laughs> i know it just confused the issue with facts uh made all-time highs today so that's kind of interesting transports have been coming back with a vengeance a little pullback today kind of hate to see them stalling so soon but so far so good with the transports banks banging on new highs with a little bit of vigor so that's good to see follow through as usual will be key insurance also begging on new highs Lithium, take a look at lithium. Lithium has just zoomed higher and now it's had this deep retrace. I wouldn't I wouldn't rush out and buy it, but it, it looks like it's trying to make a turnaround. It's gonna have some, some overhead supply along the way. The stocks also have a lot of overhead supply. Oh, I don't know if I mentioned it earlier. Gold stocks with based on the underlying commodity tend to be choppy, but the underlying commodity is actually trading more cleanly than gold is now. So it's kind of a mixed bag within the gold stocks, but they do remain in a choppy uptrend. I've seen a few stocks here that look like shorts, but I'm also seeing a few that look like potential longs. But the gold stocks can can be a little tricky. It's it's um you kind of have to be a little bit less picky with the methodology, with the persistency and the acceleration and the gaps and all these things we look for in our favor. These trend qualifiers, as I call them. You have to be a little bit more lenient when it comes to something like the semiconductors. Major drugs back to the downside, not so hot. You can see a big sell off, a little support below, but that's not enough to get excited about, right? So far, just kind of pulling back, bow tie to the downside. So that's looking kind of ugly. That was major drugs. There Now, uh, here's the semiconductors that Brian was asking about. And here's the way I look at it. They have a big picture 
semiconductors have just haven't been the place to be, okay, for a while. Now, they, they were the prior leaders, as you can see. The As a general statement, the prior leaders won't become the future leaders, as I've said a thousand times before. I think it was 2008 or whenever that energy prices went sky high, and I went to an award. I was at in Italy speaking, and there was an award ceremony, and they they got all these guys got up that ran energy funds, and they accepted a little award, and and then they gave long flowery accepted speeches. Uh, I think everybody in the world, and um, Bollinger was at the table, and I'm like, John, I, I guarantee you, not one of these guys will be here next year. And of course, what happened? Oil ran toward $200 and then crashed. So those energy funds, I'm guessing, didn't do well. And I would never be shot on Friday, but the prior leaders usually don't become future leaders. By the way, uranium waking up in here. And I don't play themes unless the database tells me to play themes. So right now, I'm starting to pay attention to lithium. Uh, it's like lithium has been dead forever in spite of everybody pumping it, right? Because Elon Musk said, hey, you should get in the lithium business or whatever. And they're quoting him and they're trying to sell you something in lithium, like the gold guys are always trying to sell you gold. Anyway, but uranium is waking up. I, I don't want to play themes again unless the charts tell me to play themes. But there there seems to be this renewed interest in nuclear hardware. I don't know if it was Microsoft or somebody or Google or somebody bought up. Uh, bought an old nuclear power plant and they're going to use it to power their ai so that's the craziness that we're we're getting into that we've got all this bitcoin out there bitcoin mining which just sucks up the power and now ai is going to be like bitcoin on steroids like times a million as far as the power requirements for it so again you got to be really careful with those themes we we traded nne it was one of our biggest winners it was like grand opening grand closing unfortunately we got in it back here on this pullback, and this thing just blasted higher. And again, every time I look at it, it makes me sick. I wish I'd, if it had options, I could have played this thing beautifully, right? But it didn't, you know. Well, what would the world be without hypothetical questions, said Mr. Wright. But yeah, I think I think keep an eye on uranium, keep an eye on lithium. Uh, some of these older areas that were leading, like real estate, are beginning to lose a little steam. It, it looks okay, okay? Uh, nice uptrend so far, kind of rallying out of the pullback. Looks okay, but it seems like new areas are beginning to emerge. Financials, banks, in insurance, kind of boring on a couple of those. But who knows? I mean, utilities, uh, and that's probably because of the uh, power demand, right? So utilities used to be sleepy old companies that you would never buy, but now they're starting to act like momentum stocks. So by paying attention to the Landry 100, I make your own momentum list. It, it I also maintain a list I call my Momo list. I have a bunch of stocks in the list that I add to and subtract from every day. And and again, that's another way to see the themes developing. Just pay attention to what's what's moving. All right, let's jump into some individual stocks. It seems likely to be a mistake. It bought down, it brought down the entire semi space. Yeah, what's the old saying though? And it, it, it's it's sort of helped me through a lot of of situations, and I can't think of exactly how it goes, but never never confuse malice with stupidity, okay? And and there's probably a better way of saying that that the actual quote um, they might just been stupid, you know? They <laughs> it might not have been pure malice; it might have just been stupidity. But because of stupidity, we have to use stops, right? And because of 10,000 other reasons. Okay, FTNT for Keith, and he says it's a hack component. FTNT, Arthur, you're next. Yeah, it looks pretty good. Um, my only problem when I when I when I back the chart way out, it's kind of all over the place. Okay, so I have a hard time getting excited about stocks. It looks like this. It almost looks like it's not adjusted for splits. Is that a show unadjusted for splits? No, no, no. It's adjusted for splits. So, yeah, it's just you you, you kind of hate to get in the stock. Like right here, it looked pretty good. You know, you hate to get in the stock that you buy it at 80, you come in the next day or a couple days later, it's at 40. You know, it's just it's kind of all over the place. And it trades in chunks. And I don't know what those days are, but that it might be one of those stocks where they come out with earnings and the stock implodes. 
and then the stock climbs back up and they come out with earnings and the stock implodes. So I would leave that one alone. That's just too crazy. But I hear you. I see what you're saying. It it, it kind of broke out of this little base it was in. But the other thing I don't like is see how it goes straight up here and then it kind of drifts higher. You actually want to see markets do this and then do that. Okay. Like the CLOV, for instance. What did it do? Look, I've got it already drawn in for you. Okay. Decent gradual uptrend, bam, accelerates higher. That's what you want instead of just the opposite. So let's let's not let's forget about that one for now. Arthur says, peg exclamation point. That's kind of interesting. The only thing that's the only reason I would pass. Well, first of all, if you back the chart out a little bit, it looked better. It looked pretty good here. Okay. Now that's got a lot of makings of the things that I just talked about, right? So it was kind of in a gradual uptrend here, it began to accelerate higher, nice little TKO move. So if I saw this stock, I'd get really excited because that's a good looking stock, Arthur. The only problem is. I'm noticing that the HV is only 17, okay? And not to beat the dead horse, but where's Clove? Clove's 110. Now, that's borderline a little ridiculous, but you kind of get my point. If you want to beat the overall market, where are the P's right now? Let's take a look at the P's. The P's are at 13, okay? You're going to need something with the HV a lot bigger than the overall market. And that's historical volatility. The formula for telecharts about that long. For Metastock, it's only about that big. And I can help you find those formulas. I have the formula for telechart. Um, and I, I think I have the one for Metastock. But uh, you could Google, you can get the formula online for these. Uh, they're in forms and all. Okay, what else? So are the TLN, TLN. Uh, good pick on the peg. It's just the volatility is low. Yeah, this is one that's been in my Landry list a lot lately. And, and again, a few days ago, it looked a lot better than it does now, okay? So like right there, it's kind of a deep pullback in an IPO. Uh, energies right now are a little questionable. Energies, oil energy, right? But that looked kind of neat because it took off and then it had a deep pullback. So that looked pretty good. But now you can see that it's kind of stolen out in this rally out of a pullback. So I'm keeping this one on my watch list. This I think this one came out of Landry 100 when it began to fall off. Keep it on your watch list, but I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, rush out and, and trade that one right now. All right, any more? TLN, we just did that. Going once, going twice. Let me wait a second for YouTube to catch up. And while we're at an impasse, I just want to thank everybody for attending tonight. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedules. Anything unanswered, DavidDaveLander.com. And also come next week and ask questions because without you, without questions, I wouldn't have a show. All right, I think that's it. Uh, everybody have a great night. I'll see most of you guys tomorrow in my Facebook group, Dave Landry's Trend Traders. Everyone else, have a good weekend and hopefully see all you guys and girls again next Thursday. And also, may the trend be with you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Oh, squeeze one in, old school HPQ. Well, sometimes these old companies can reinvent themselves. That's eh, just wide and loose and all over the place sideways, yeah. We snuck one in there. All right, again, uh, everyone, are you welcome? May the trend be with you. See you next week.